I was speaking yesterday, and mainly uh, some group of Kenyans were there trying to raise an equity fund to invest in Uganda, where they will bring what they call venture capital. They want to invest in people's businesses, areas that the bank doesn't want to touch, the high-risk areas. There's this company called Fanisi. And I was telling them, I benchmark mainly because of my job as investment authority, Uganda against Kenya. I'm always competing with Kenya. And Kenya is miles ahead of us. Why are they so far ahead of us? Okay, they've had peace. We went through our dark period, our dark history, which we cannot walk away from. They've had stability. They have stronger financial institutions. But even the people's attitude, the mentality, the Kikuyu, who doesn't like the Kalenjin or the Gluo, same for business, they get together. They put their money together. We have begun investment clubs here, but these people had them 20 years ago. This kind of meeting, every hotel in Kenya, in Eldoret, in Mombasa, there are meetings of people sharing business ideas. Let's do property together. How can we do property? You all come together, we bring money, we put the rules, and we strike a piece of land, subdivide it, and we see how we share. We all benefit from bringing our monies together. In Uganda, 15 years ago, there was one or two circles. There's a push now for the Bank of Uganda to regulate these circles. Why do Ugandans fail? We don't have a culture of honoring our commitments. When we take money from a bank, we don't want to pay it back on time because of school fees or because your wife was sick or something happened. The bank doesn't know that. You've got to go and explain to them. But hiding from them destroys you. Then they come and repossess your property, which was not their ultimate goal. They wanted to lend you money and they get their interest and capital back but they end up taking your money. So many people say, me, I don't borrow. I never go to a bank, no. And I look at these people, they are educated, they are smart. When you borrow from a bank like Crane Bank, he'll give you money at, say, 20%. Let's make it easy, 24%, which works out 2% per month. If you're doing a small business and you cannot make more than 2% to pay back his bank and make some profit, then don't do that business. It's not worth it. Use that as a benchmark, the interest rate. When you invest in a business, because his interest is spread over the year. Now, globally to start a business, many people want capital. And that's the most common story amongst the young people. Where can I get capital? I want to do business, but I don't have capital. I often ask, what's your idea? Capital should be the last thing. Now, quickly, there are six ways to get capital. Number one, you can inherit it. If your parents were rich, you can inherit it. Very few of us will inherit that capital. Largely, we are a poor community. Number two, you can marry into it. If you mind, find a very rich family, and you take on, you lobby, you get in. But I warn you, the mother-in-law, she will spot you. It's not a very good route to go. Number three, some people think they can gamble. They can win it, lottery. Casino. After what he did with the Premier Lottery, you think anybody can win? <laughs> Not easy. I wouldn't count on that. Many people got the casinos thinking they all, it's their lucky day. Just because when you came out, the matter was there, you jumped on time, you reached there, someone was waiting for you. I'm, eh, I'm on a roll here. You put your little money in a, a, a casino. No. Other people think they can steal. Let's learn how to steal. These guys have made Bichupuli, they've done what? They've made money. They go and they plan ready to steal. Now, I would not advise anybody to do it. If you want light and you get a candle like that, it's not worth holding that light. Stealing, you will never live peacefully. You will always be looking over your shoulder. There are only two ways left to get money. One way is you have to earn it. You have to work. If you get a job, it may pay you little, but earn some money. Earn a little bit of money and show people that you can earn. And if you can prove that you have the ability to earn, then you can go to the last method, which is to borrow. And many of us fall in that category. You have to borrow if you want to accelerate your growth. So it is earning or borrowing. When you earn, you have to save. What you save, you can invest. Without that, you cannot do the other. So those are the six ways in which you can raise money. Largely, learning how to borrow. If you're not sure and you're not focused, you don't have the discipline, then don't borrow. Because whatever security you take, ultimately, they will not sympathize. The money they are is too much money. They have the responsibility to protect it. So, watch out for that.
back to the beginning, why do so many businesses again fail? Uganda, we know all these things. Many of you have been in schools. I go to MOBS, the school or the heart of where they are training people in business, and they're all looking like they don't know. In Uganda, what is unique? Is it because we are largely Christians? We were taught when you are young as Christians that don't worry, don't be greedy, have little. The rich people going to heaven is like going through the eye of a needle. <laughs> it's good to be poor, you will be rewarded in heaven. A lord of baloney. Whoever tells you that got it wrong. The biggest thing in my, in my view is skills. We do not have practical skills. We overemphasize this academic education and you come out a graduate but you know nothing. You cannot survive. You cannot control your environment. The skills we have, there's a big mismatch. People who start businesses, too many businesses are undercapitalized. You think it's going to work out. You're over optimistic about the cash flow. Then you consume it, expenses, everything, down. Poor business plan. We have this culture, like I said, of not honoring our commitments. Many people are given pre advanced ship finance to buy maize. They give you, you bring you 20 bags of maize, you give me a pickup. When I go to the village, I buy the maize, I've got your money. On the way, I say, let me sell it to somebody else, make some money, and I'll buy for you next time. That not honoring our commitments, a weak system. Our value system is weak. And slowly I see, especially amongst the Muslims, some of them are stricter. They have that discipline. Many of you complain, these Indians, they came here without money. But overnight, they've become millionaires. Discipline. The Chinese have come in Chikubo. Discipline. They didn't have that much money. They work hard. Overnight, they grow. But there are many strong names in Chikubo who I respect. <laughs> Oji, Kagoro. Solid names in Chikubo. Not educated. I've seen these guys walking around, very humble, in slippers, in shorts, doing little businesses, but they have grown to live their own properties worth millions of dollars. They're not sophisticated, but they know what they want in life. These are some of the challenges. Why can't we get together and mobilize? When it's a wedding or a funeral, we get together because that's how we are taught our culture. But when there's a business opportunity, we don't get together. But this is a preamble. I've maybe spoken too much. I want to give my colleagues a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Let me ask Sidil to say something. Mr. Rugendo here. Um, he has changed the media, how the media works, how the media thinks. And he, his paper was the underdog. And I, I remember when the red paper first came out and with their sense of humor and, and the kind of language they use. Of course, I won't repeat it here. Uh, I, I, I went one evening to a friend of mine's place, you know, a very prominent uh, couple. Um, and, and the husband will not tell the wife that she was buying the red paper, the wife will not tell the husband is buying the right paper. But we started discussing and slowly, slowly the words they were using were coming out from both, both the people. <laughs> and of course you realize that they both have been thinking and then of course they all came in the open. But now it, it, it's, a, um, it's a very good paper. I, I get three papers at home in the morning. The first paper I pick up is red paper. And that's true. Really true. Maybe if I could ask you a question, uh, um, I was told to ask you this question, uh, Sudhir. Uh, how do you formulate a winning business idea? You have so much companies under your docket, I think 14 or 16 of them. I don't know how many they are. But how did you start? How do you sniff a business idea and make it work? Well, I, you know, I, I really... Um, do business which suits my lifestyle, really. I, I, I like to do things with passion. I don't do business because, you know, Patrick is successful at certain things, and, and I'll follow that. You know, I, I, in, in the sense, I mean, we have common things in real estate because you can't, you know, that's common for everybody. And, and, but, you know, other innovations that Patrick has got, he's skilled at it, he, 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 he's got his heart in it. 
So I will actually, you know, go into business with, which suits my lifestyle. So hotels, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm an outgoing person, it suits my lifestyle. Uh, meet the people. Uh, uh, <clears throat> then you have education. I didn't have much, so, you know, uh, I, I just want to make sure that I, I build good schools in Uganda so we can educate people, uh, children here. Second, did you have, did you have money to start? I don't know what, I don't know what business you started with, uh, particularly, was it a bank? Did you wake mm. up and dream of starting a bank? Did you build Munyonyo out of nowhere? How did it start? I, I think it's a long story. I, I don't know if you have time to listen to. Would you like to listen to this story? Yeah. Great. So the, 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 the people <coughs> have, have asked that you should say it. Okay, here we go. Right, I'll start with um, my father's grandfather. They came to Mombasa in 1897. The mood, uh, five brothers came to Mombasa from India. Um, you know, they're the business, they were traders. And <clears throat> two of the brothers moved in, in road. As the railways moved in, they, they moved their trading post with the railways. Um, they were dealing with the workers on the railway sites, and they were dealing with the local, um, the, the, the people who lived in the area where they moved into, you know. <clears throat> in 1903, they reached Uganda and, and, and started their first operation, which was uh, basically trading again. Um, I think in 1918, the five brothers split up and, uh, and my father's grandfather went his own way. His settlement of the partnership was around two, the currency that was used at the time was rupees and he got a settlement of 200,000 rupees which was about 10,000 pounds it's a lot of money then still a lot of money now but of course my my grandfather who's my father's father he blew part of the money 